Hi, and welcome to Next Level Carpentry. I'm Matt Jackson, and I just want to wish everybody a Happy New Year. 2018 was an exciting year for growth and challenges for Next Level Carpentry, and with a move from my old shop last summer uh, into new digs here, I've been faced with a lot of uh, housekeeping work, a lot of necessary projects and some work-related stuff, and I thought it'd be good to start off the new year with a project that's just plain old fun. It might be said that Next Level Carpentry is the home of the Jumbo Carpenter's Pencil. These are part of the decor here at the shop, uh, starting with this pencil that I made quite a few years ago for my uh, carpentry business, um, to this one, which I wanted to be the main sign for the Next Level Carpentry shop, and then to these small big pencils that I've used for pointers a time or two. And a number of people have commented about the pencils over time, and they're a lot of fun to build. So I thought, let's just do that project and start off the new year. As a side note, quite some time back, I got a request from another quite prominent YouTuber who asked me if he could pay me to make a jumbo carpenter pencil for uh, his personal use and possible use on his channel. And I committed at the time to do that. I had no idea it was going to be nine months before I could honor the request. So that's another motivation to do this video here and now. Some viewers will have noticed these pencils around uh, in the shop and in different videos, but I'll go into a little detail here real quick. Um, these are true to scale pencils. Um, these are next level carpentry pencils that I use for uh, promotional things and all the proportions are uh, just upscaled from a real pencil, from a real carpenter's pencil to these jumbo pencils. Uh, these are made much the same way a real carpenter's pencil is with two halves of wood glued together around the lead. Something that is different about these pencils, and you might not notice, is that the lead is a piece of wood that slips inside a hollow tube rather tightly. And so that I don't have to have a piece of uh, ebony that runs all the way through the pencil, I just have a little dummy piece at each end. And there's a stick that uh, connects the two in the middle. But the pencil itself is hollow. So one of the challenges for making these is to get a rectangular hollow hole all the way through the pencil that's the same size so this lead can fit in to give the effect of a real pencil with real graphite in it. So that makes the pencils not only realistic uh, but functional and um, kind of surprising for people. It's always fun to show that. The small pencils here are the same way. The lead's very tight, but it does come out and there's just a stick in the middle between the two pieces. This is real gaboon ebony uh, used for these pieces of faux lead in the pencil. The pencils also have writing that starts near one end and when the pencil's flipped over the writing goes the opposite direction. And the reason for that is as the pencil gets sharpened down and whittles away part of the words you can always look to the other side of the pencil so that the advertising impact is visible until the pencil's a nub. So with that bit of uh, insight and background into these pencils, I'll get into the process of how I can accurately scale these pencils so that the proportions uh, are maintained from a regular pencil and they don't st start looking out of proportion. This pencil um, is shorter than a than a full pencil would be when it gets sharpened in scale. Uh, it turns out I had a piece of wood that, that's, that was that long and I wanted to make as big a pencil as I could and that's what I ended up with. When I did this pencil I purposely bought a piece of wood so that this is true to scale from the seven inch length of a typical pencil. And the way I do all that is with the magic of SketchUp 3D modeling software. I'll take you through that process uh, here in the shop first then go to the computer for a screen capture to show how the scaling process works. And um, 
It's pretty simple to do, and I think viewers would be able to mimic it for building jumbo pencils or scaling other uh, objects with a similar process. I've made pencils out of all sorts of material. Uh, this one is uh, radiata pine, when I could get thick, uh, full one inch um, rough radiata pine. Uh, that's how that one ended up with that wood. Uh, this one is cedar. I wanted it to mimic a, uh, a real pencil as best I could. I bought some 2x6 western cedar and made that pencil. These were uh, smaller. For this version, I used cherry. It turned out to be a real nice wood for the, um, for the job. And because I'm not actually sharpening these on a regular basis, the wood can be harder than the, the firm but soft wood used on a regular carpenter's pencil. The project that we're going to be doing here, I'll make out of this piece of walnut. This board's got some history to it and some nice grain, so it'll make a very attractive uh, jumbo pencil. And the reason I bring it up is because knowing that I'm starting out with this piece of wood, I know that the two layers of the pencil to make the two faces of the pencil, I need to be able to get those made out of this piece of wood. It's a full three quarter inch thick in the rough and I'll be able to plane it down so it's exactly three quarters of an inch. So my goal in scaling from a genuine pencil up to the jumbo pencil we'll be making in the video is to make the faces each exactly three quarters of an inch and the other proportions will follow. I hope that makes sense. I can either start out with the size of the pencil that I want to end up with and get the wood, or in this case, I've got the wood and that'll determine the size of the pencil through the scaling process. You'll see what I mean here in a minute. And you can see I jotted a note on this board when I got it from a friend who got it in turn from his brother who worked in Hazard County, Kentucky. I got the board in November of 2014. I get the idea that Daryl had this board for a good 20 years. So it's got some history and I think it'll make a fitting use to go into a jumbo pencil as a gift for a full and interesting second life. You can see this beautiful piece of walnut is a full 7 eighths of an inch thick. That gives me room for flattening and straightening for the pencil parts because they need to be dead accurate to get the kind of results we're after with this project. Not all carpenter pencils are created equal. There are slight variations in size and material from one to the other, and I generally prefer the full bodied size, similar to these next level carpentry pencils. I have another one here that's identical in width and thickness, but the beveling is slightly different. The three facets on this white pencil are all about an eighth of an inch. This has a slightly wider one in the middle, and the two bevels are a little smaller. I prefer this. Uh, these Dixon red and black pencils are a great pencil. Uh, the lead is uh, about the same size as these pencils. There's just less wood around them. Uh, it's a great pencil. Uh, I just tend to prefer the larger bodied ones for some reason. Maybe they're just better for scribing or a little easier to hang on to wearing gloves or that sort of thing. So with all that said, this is the pencil shape that we'll be mimicking for this jumbo pencil build. And I don't need the caliper for this first measurement because you can see this pencil is just slightly less than seven inches, and this one is just slightly more. So I'm just going to go with an even seven inches for a pencil length to scale from. This white pencil is 37 64ths in width and 9 30 seconds thick. The face is exactly 7 16ths of an inch wide. Let's call this facet an eighth of an inch. And remember that the two side facets are about the same. But we'll use one eighth of an inch for the width of the side facet for our model. The lead looks like it is seven thirty seconds of an inch wide. And let's call it three thirty seconds of an inch thick. And with that set of dimensions from an actual pencil, we'll jump over to the computer and a screen capture and I'll show how I quickly create a pencil model with SketchUp and then use the scaling function of SketchUp to increase this 932nd of an inch dimension until it's one and a half inches, which will mean that the two laminations for the pencil will each be three quarters of an inch. All right, well, we're looking at SketchUp here, and this section isn't meant to be a SketchUp tutorial, but rather just a way that I can show you how I was able to take dimensions from the actual pencil and scale them up for this Uber pencil. The first thing I'm going to do here is draw three rectangles. 
The first one is to represent the width of the pencil and the thickness of the edge at 37 64 by 1 8 of an inch. If you keep an eye on the value control box in the lower right hand corner of the screen, you can see how I type in the dimensions and this is 37 slash 64 comma 1 slash 8. And once I hit enter, it makes the rectangle that size. You can see it about disappears in scale with this guy standing here. So I'm going to get rid of the guy and then use the zoom extends tool to put that small rectangle in the perspective in the screen. I'll make that rectangle a group and then draw the next one. And this one represents the thickness of the pencil and the width of the face at 27 64 by 9 30 seconds. I'll make this a group also. And then the third rectangle will represent the size and shape of the lead, which is 7 30 seconds by 3 30 seconds of an inch. I'll make that a group. Now I'm going to center the thickness of the pencil on the width of the pencil by holding shift and the move, using the move tool. Then I'll position the width of the edge in the thickness of the pencil. And last, I'll center up the lead in the width of the pencil and the thickness of the pencil. With those three rectangles centered up on each other, I'm just going to move a copy off to the side in case I need it for future use. And then I'm going to go in here and just verify that the facets on the corners are going to be 45 degrees. And I know that it is because doing math with the dimensions tells me that a 45 degree angle will line up that corner. But if you're questioning your measurements, this step will verify if you were accurate enough. And as you can see, it is. So I'm going to explode the two larger rectangles and then select everything inside and then hold shift to reverse the selection and delete everything except the rectangle that represents the lead. Next, I'll take the line tool and connect these four line segments. And I'm assured that all these dimensions are exact, they're symmetrical, and that they're at 45 degrees. Next, I'll explode the last rectangle and delete the face out of that lead. Grab the push-pull tool and extrude this and type in 7 Enter, which makes it 7 inches long. By triple clicking, I can turn this whole pencil into a group. Then I'll go in and add dimensions to this creation. And you'll see that these dimensions are in 1 16th inch precision, even though I entered them in 30 seconds and 60 fourths. This is the thickness of the lead, width of the lead, and now I'm selecting that geometry and turning it into a group. I thought I did that already, but there you have it. The last dimension here is going to be that 7 inch length and the total thickness of the pencil. Now, if I go up into Windows and Model Info, you can see that the units here are set at 1 16th of an inch precision. So I'm changing it to fractional at 1 64th of an inch. And now you can see that the dimensions read the way I entered them. For all you metric viewers out there, if I switch this to decimal and centimeters, you can see that in an instant, this all converts to metric if those are the numbers you're more familiar with and used to working with. But I'm going to go back to fractions here and scale this up. So I'm selecting all the geometry and dimensions so far. I'm just going to bump them over here in arbitrary 5 inches, then reselect the pencil and its dimensions and move a copy of it over next to the point of origin. Once that's done, I select the pencil geometry itself and not the dimensions and grab the scale tool and a corner handle and begin to upsize this pencil. I'll move the overall thickness dimension out to the side a little bit so you can keep an eye on it because that's the dimension I want to end up at an inch and a half like that. So you can see all these dimensions are changed in scale. I can shuffle them around a little bit to make them more readable. And I'm going to add a dimension for this facet. And I'll go back to metric so that anybody that's interested can save this screenshot once I quit wiggling it around for a reference if you're interested in building a pencil exactly this size. And here's a thickness of half the pencil, which is the three quarter inch I was shooting for in the first place because that's the thickness of pieces I should be able to get out of the rough sawn walnut board. And here's that screenshot in imperial dimensions if anybody is planning on making a pencil of this exact size. So once I've got the model scaled to the size I want it, I'll take a screen capture and print it out and then take that out to the shop to use as my plan. Well, I hope you can see with that scaling process that regardless of what size jumbo pencil you choose to make, if you just start out with the initial pencil size dimensions, I'll post that photograph on Pinterest and eventually I'll get a picture of it on the nextlevelcarpentry.shop website. But for now, uh, those initial dimensions are pretty solid uh, to go with for the proportions so that your pencil ends up a realistic uh, configuration. The results I got from the scaling process tell me that I need to get pieces out of this initial board that are 37 inches long, 3 and 5 64 inch uh, wide, 
and exactly three quarters of an inch thick. I think there's enough wood in this board that I can actually make two pencils. So that's what I'm going to shoot for and see how it goes. Now that I know the scale dimensions for the jumbo pencil, I figured out that I can make four pieces, uh, four pencil pieces out of this board. Uh, I'll cut it in half this way basically and then split it that way so I have four separate faces for two pencils. If you can see this in the camera, this board's got a, quite a bit of twist in it. <clears throat> it's got a fair amount of bow or hook, whatever you want to call it. And with those factors to work with, I don't have a lot of thickness here to flatten this out. So I've got to cut it down as close to the final size as I can before I go through the flattening and straightening process. <clears throat> For instance, if I went to take this full quarter inch bow out, all of a sudden the ends of this board would be three quarters of an inch. By the time I got a quarter in of an inch twist out of it, I'd be lucky to get a quarter inch strip out of this whole piece if I tried to flatten it all at once. So by quartering it and getting the pieces down to near their width and length before flattening and thicknessing it, I've got a lot better chances of ending up with nice three quarter inch pieces from this board that's seven eighths of an inch thick. You can see the twist as it rocks on the saw top. There's some wane on this end uh, with this bark. This is a pretty uh, grain structure. I'm hoping I can preserve that in one of the pencil faces. The other end of the board has bark or wane on the opposite corner. So I'll cut this in half and then rip two strips starting from this side to trim as much as that bark off ahead of time. And the same thing on this end. After it gets cut in half, I'll start the width I need from this side and uh, some of this will go away as waste before I even start flattening. I need to end up at 3 and 5 64 inch width, which is just a little bit over 3 and a 16th. So I'm going to shoot for about a 3 and an 8, 3 and 3 16 inch rough width and see what I can do for thickness. If I can end up with more than 3 quarters, I will. I need to end up at right at 37 inches in length, but I've got enough extra here that I can go 38 and a quarter twice and still cut off this bark on the end, which will help me optimize the look of the pieces I end up with. And it looks like some of this pretty grain here will end up in one of the pencils. Just gotta love the smell of cutting walnut. Mm. I like to pre-straighten an edge before even rough width ripping so that I know what I'm working with going into it. With the planed edge on the good edge of each of these pieces, I can maximize the amount of this bark that I can cut off in the pre-width ripping process. Well, I may have been a bit optimistic about getting two pencils out of this board. I need about three and an eighth. I've barely got six and a quarter. This bark isn't going to go away and that's not the show face of the wood, which is this face. I may only get two pencils out of this by using the good edge of each of these boards. But things like this, they just can't tell until you're actually cutting. I like to hit faces of wood. I'm going to run through the planer with a sharp putty knife just in case there's sand or grit or a metal shaving in that face. Those sorts of things can get embedded into wood just from handling and it's especially true with wood that's been jostled around the country as long as this beautiful old piece of walnut has been. Squiggle lines help me keep track of planing progress on the faces. Well, there was enough thickness in that whole board from Hazard County, Kentucky that I was able to flatten one face of each of the pieces. I've got the flat faces here together. I'm going to put them back side to back side. You can see how much irregularity there was in the wood. Plenty of twist, but I was able to clean them up nicely and get all that out of there and still have just proud of three quarters of an inch so that the final pass on the thickness planer will clean it up to exactly three quarters, which is where this needs to end up. The next step is to plane these boards down to a consistent thickness of three quarters of an inch. 
or possibly just a touch more. So I'm starting with a planer set at a little bit less than 7 eighths to work these pieces down. This is a new setup to me with the dust processor hooked up. I need to rework this setup because this hose will get in the way of longer boards. I need a 90 degree fitting to get the hose to come down on this side, out, around, and out of the way. And the dust port on this is just plastic, so I need to build some kind of an auxiliary arm to support this against the weight and the stress of the hose itself. But I can plane these short pieces now and get away with it. The finish should come out beautifully on this walnut because I just switched the edges on the knives in the planer last night. And if anybody's interested in seeing how that's done, you can check out the care and feeding of a DW735 planer to see what that knife changing process looks like. Since the only machine hooked up right now is the thickness planer, I'm able to turn the power setting down considerably so that the manometer needle lines up with the ideal setting. I forgot to press the record button before planing the first side of all these pieces. The finish on these pieces when they come out of the planer with its brand new set of knives installed is absolutely remarkable. You can see the sheen on it and that's just from the planer. You can also see the squiggle marks and the unevenness in the wood. This is the result of planing the twist and warp and bow out of the boards. We've got a corner here that's really thin and low. Same thing with this end. But I'll plane that down so I have a perfectly clean and smooth finish on one face of all these pieces. So this is the second pass, but I add extra lines on the wood to make it obvious when the whole surface is plain flat clear out to the end of all the boards. Well, I cut it really close, trying to get four pieces that were three and five sixty-fourths uh, by three quarters of an inch thick out of that piece of walnut. I succeeded with two of them. These will be excellent, but there's too much uh, wane and bark on these other two pieces. To make another pencil, they've got a good show face here, but the edge of the pencil won't be any good with this. So I'll go back to the computer and scale this down a bit more to see what thickness and length I need if the pieces are only two and a half inches wide, which should be small enough to eliminate the bark and bug-eaten wood on the edge of these two pieces. So you're looking at a screen capture of me using SketchUp to resize the pencil. And what you see me doing is selecting just the pencil geometry itself and moving a copy of it and then adding a width dimension to the copied pencil geometry. Next you see I use the scale tool to grab a corner handle and stretch this out until the width reading ends up at exactly two and a half inches. Once I've rescaled it to two and a half inches width, I'll add the other necessary dimensions for fabricating these parts in the shop so that the defects in the wood can be cut around to end up with a smaller but clean jumbo pencil. Back in the shop, I'll use these dimensions, uh, primarily the 39 inch thickness for these at a two and a half inch width and a length a little over 30 inches to clean up the bark, uh, this bug damage, etc. from these pieces. Three quarters of an inch is 48 sixty-fourths. Five eighths of an inch is 40 sixty-fourths. And I need to end up at 39 sixty-fourths, so I need to take off an eighth plus a sixty-fourth, which is two and one-fourth turns of the crank. Removing that strong eighth of an inch in thickness just about removed all the defects in itself. So now cutting it down to two and a half inch width will clean it up nicely for this Uber pencil. I'll rip these at two and nine sixteenths and then two passes with the widthness planer will clean it up the rest of the way. Anytime I use a thickness planer for planing the width of a board, I call it a widthness planer. And you can see that the scrap from this is pretty much nothing but bark and bug damage. And the pieces are optimized for appearance and stability. And now two passes through the thickness planer will get me down to precisely two and a half inches with nice, clean, planed edges. Again, pencil marks helping to visualize the planing in progress. Make sure that I get all the saw marks out and clean up both edges. So this part of a project can be a little bit tedious because of all the steps required to go from a piece of wood in its uh, rough sawn state into the finished pieces that are necessary to proceed with the pencil making process. These pieces each have good sides and bad sides, good edges and bad edges. 
So now is when I go through and choose the show faces and the interior faces. And these are where they'll get dadoed for the lead slot. I think it's kind of interesting to see how this board ended up getting cut and flipped and turned to yield these pencil pieces out of that rough sawn piece of walnut. The biggest part of the scrap was on this side at this end of the board and then it switched over to the smaller pencil face and the bark on this side of the board at this end. But by cutting up the board ahead of time and milling it, I was able to preserve as much useful wood out of a valuable board by going through that process in that order rather than just planing it flat and straight as a, as a whole piece in the beginning. And there's a similar visual tale to tell by looking at the backside of the piece after the milling process is done. As it turns out, all the dado faces where the lead's going to go all ended up on the back of the board. And I know there was a lot of uh, potentially tedious steps getting to this point in the pencil build project. But if the parts aren't accurate, precise, straight, and flat at this point, then creating the hollow rectangular opening through the pencil is really not possible. So with these pieces of exact match thickness and width, it's time to lay out the dados for the lead in scale size in each of the two pencils. The process is the same, but the dimensions are different. So I'll just cover the steps on the bigger of the two pencils. From the SketchUp drawing, I can see that the lead is 1 and 5 30 seconds inch in width and a half inch thick. Because we're making pencil halves, the depth of the dado will be a quarter inch and this 1 and 5 30 seconds will be centered up in the overall width of the pencil because this is a finished width dimension. If I were making quite a number of these pencils, I would probably set up a dado blade for making the slot where the lead will go. But as it is, I'm using a full eighth inch kerf Freud blade. I don't remember the number of this, but I'll look it up. And the significant thing about this blade is that it has a flat top grind so that it'll make a slot with a flat bottom. I'm using a forest blade stabilizer to ensure the truest cut possible. And I've put a 1 8 inch blade insert specifically for this cut. It's tough enough to see as it is and even tougher on walnut. But according to measurements on SketchUp, I need to be 61 64 of an inch in from each edge of the board, which should leave a slot of 1 and 5 30 seconds inch centered up on the face of the piece. And granted, these tolerances are nowhere near necessary, but I'm kind of leaving them in here just to mess with the metric savvy viewers in the world who are going to give me no end of grief about using fractions to this extent. I intend to do a metric conversion in SketchUp with all these dimensions in a feeble attempt to maintain subscribers from metric parts of the world. I'll set the blade depth by making a test cut on a piece of scrap and checking the depth with the dial caliper. I don't like the idea of trying to measure depth by the blade itself because there's always a question of whether it's at the tangent point or not and all the fuss that's involved. Much better to guess a little bit low and sneak up on the final depth measurement of one fourth of an inch. I'll buy that. My initial setting for the fence is going to be a full one inch. That way I know I'm inside of the final width margin that I want to have on this piece. After I get the middle cleaned out, I'll go back and dial in the distance from each edge so that the slot is perfectly centered in each side of each face. And plowing these grooves is pretty routine. I make the rip along each edge, flipping the piece end for end, move the fence over, uh, rinse, lather, and repeat until the whole middle is gone. Any thin slivers like this that happen to get left in between are easily cleaned up later but can be disposed of in the meantime by simply tying them in pretty braided loops. With the bulk of this dado plowed out eighth inch blade, I'll go back to a test scrap and set the shoulder to 61 64 I'm liking that, so I'll use this setup to run the final pass on both edges of both faces which should leave the desired slot width of 1 and 5 30 seconds inch. It's going to be tough to argue with that. But any of the little flash that's left over between the saw cuts can be easily cleaned out with a sharp 
putty knife. Leaving that for a finished surface and leaving a very precise rectangular channel in each piece and a precise hole down through the middle of the blanks. Now that I've got the dados plowed in both of the faces for the two pencils, two different sizes, I've got one last bit of homework to do and that is to make a glue clean out stick. Once we glue these together, push them together, glue squeeze out on the outside is a piece of cake to clean up, but cleaning all the way down through that center hole with all the clamps on is a bit of a challenge. Experience has taught me to make a push block for that. So I've taken a piece of eighth inch thick PVC sheeting, drilled a hole in it, pilot hold a hole into the stick, cut slightly beveled ends on here. This thickness is just slightly less than the lead and once the everything is glued up I can push this down through keeping pressure on one edge by riding on this part and that'll clean out the glue squeeze out all the way through on both sides. So I made two of the push blocks, one for each size of lead for the same purpose. So once this is glued up, the glue squeeze out can be cleaned out of the inside all the way through. The stick is longer than either pencil and I got the two different size push blocks, one on each end. So one stick with two blocks works for both pencils. All right, the next step is to glue up the bigger of the two pencils. You can see I've dry fit everything. Keep in mind that these two pieces are uh, just rough cut for length so I don't need to worry about lining up the ends. I just need to make sure that one side is perfectly flush. The pieces are the same width so once one side matches up the other side matches up. Because these are finished faces I'm using clamps with plastic pads. The only clamps I have with compound leverage and plastic pads on them are way too long for this job, but that's what I'm using. I selected the grain of these two edges to go together. This is kind of has a book match look to it. This is a less desirable side, but it goes pretty well together and I thought it was better than this orientation. So that's how I lined it up. One of these days I'm going to get tight bond to compensate me for all the free promotion I've given them. But I really like the glue for this sort of project. I like to keep a little silicone roller pan and roller. And I just put a little shot of dihydrogen oxide in the pan to keep the roller fresh. I want a full coat of glue on here, but not an oozing coat. So I will just start out with laying down a bead from this nozzle on these faces. And I want to make sure that I have a thorough thin coat of glue on each of the four faces and I want it evenly distributed as best I can and the texture of this roller helps roll out that nice even coat. Because I've already planned on dealing with glue squeeze out I would rather my joints are over full than under full. But if it gets a little too much like that I can just squeegee it off more or less with that roller just so there's a nice full coat on there all the way across on each of the four faces. And there's nothing better than dihydrogen oxide for cleaning up this glue. Plus it's good for your health. I'm liking that. Flop these guys together and give them a good rub. You can always double check stuff to make sure you got a full coat on there. It'll be fine. I'm more or less lining up my ends. This kind of glue squeeze out is what I'm looking for on both faces. And this is kind of the show edge of the pencil. If there was an A and a B edge, this is the A edge. So I'm going to follow it most closely. Just start gluing this up or clamping it up. And if clamping pressure misaligns the faces, I just readjust it so that it ends up perfectly flush when the clamp is tight. And until the glue kind of gets settled and evenly dispersed, these pieces can continue to move around. Even under pressure, I can always give it a little tweak at the end of the piece like this. Of course the battery died in the middle of the glue up process, but I shall press on. And this is where precision part preparation pays off. because There's a whole lot of alignment issues I don't have to deal with because I know they're handled in the preparation. These wide jaw clamps are putting even pressure on both sides. And I just bear down on those with all I've got. I need the slightest bit of realignment at this end. I'm using giant channel locks to put a little pressure on there and even up those faces. I'm liking that a lot. 
got to glue up that other pencil off camera, so I want to make sure that that roller doesn't get all glommed up, even though it's silicone, which flakes dried glue off quite easily. Most viewers are expecting this next step, which involves using sawdust, aka guy glitter, for cleaning up glue squeeze out while it's still wet. A liberal smattering of that, and a sharp putty knife. Cleans that glue off right now. Which is a whole lot better than waiting a couple hours until it's dried and crusted on there. And then removing it with a scraper and chipping up the wood in the process. It will be redundant for some viewers, but those who have not watched me glue up anything before should notice that I am not touching this with warm water and a rag. There's a sure way to spoil a project by doing that. Yes, warm water and a rag will soften the glue and help it wash off, but it also makes it thin and runny, and that thin glue will run into the pores of the wood and can easily spoil an otherwise excellent project. So if you think wet rags and warm water are the way to clean up glue, squeeze out, go for it. Not in my shop. These ends will just get cut off clean to the right length after everything's dry. So now it's time to take the ramrod glue stick here and push out the squeeze out. And it would have been smart to put a wad of sawdust down there for that glob to land in. But hey, the important thing is the glue's cleaned out of there. Now I can flip the whole contraption over. Clean up what's left on the other side. And I'll even sprinkle a little sawdust down in there. Put a little in this end, give it a push. It worked quite nicely. This is difficult to capture on camera with these gangly clamps on here, but I think I can get this lined up and you can see it's nice and clean all the way down through there. So I'll be able to put a piece of lead in each end and have it fit nice and snug when it's all said and done. Well, that's the glue up process, such as it is. I hope that all the steps and sequence and little uh, details that become important are uh, obvious and make sense, but I've got to clean this mess up after I glue up the other pencil. And then once these are dry, I'll pick it up to finish shaping the pencil body by cutting it to length, fitting the lead, and then sharpening the end like a real carpenter's pencil. Considering the rarity and high cost of genuine Gaboon Ebony, I use a very thin curved blade. This is actually a seven and a quarter inch blade for a circular saw but it has a 5 8 arbor, so I can use it in the table saw. And that way I'm not wasting a speck more wood than is absolutely necessary by turning it into sawdust. I don't know if it shows up in the camera or not, but I've marked out on the end the size of the two pieces of lead I need for each of the pencils, and I'll trim part of this away and save that piece for something else. The two blanks I'm cutting out are both thicker and wider than the final piece. A seven and a quarter inch blade and a 10 inch saw just looks, feels, and sounds different than the real deal. But it's a great way to conserve precious wood. I pre-ripped the maple sticks to act as lead extenders for the ebony, and they're just approximate size, as are the pieces of ebony. But I need to cut these randomly and just make sure the ebony and the maple all have square ends for the next step. With square ends on all these pieces, I can now glue them together and then mill them the final size to fit into the rectangular hole that goes through the pencil. This way I've got extenders on here that take up the snipe in the thickness planer and keep me from man having to manage so many separate parts. This is a permanent connection, so I've given this a very liberal coat of Gorilla CA glue. I want that to soak into the wood fibers on both sides of the joint as it cures.
I overcompensated a bit because of the density of the maple and the ebony. Not much glue soaks in, but too much is better than not enough. So that piece is stiff enough for milling to the final size, and it also serves as the final connection between the extender and the piece of ebony that acts as the lead for the pencil. And I need to do that for both lead sizes. With these pieces glued up, I'll put the square corner down and in towards the fence and take a frog's hair off these two faces to make sure they're straight and true before trimming with a table saw and finishing up in the thickness planer. So these are the two faces that I'll index off of for dialing in the width and the thickness. Because by design, this blank is still wider and thicker than it's going to end up so that it fits snugly in this rectangular hole. But now I have two true faces to work off of as I dial in the size to get the lead to fit snugly but not too snug. The square corner on this piece is almost sharp enough to cut you. The precision of these joints with a little bit of CA glue, it's basically just wood to wood. You can't even feel that joint in this piece. And tolerances like this in these pieces is just rewarding to be able to do. Mistakes still happen. Parts can fail. If I drop this on the ground, I'll be an unhappy camper because I'll have to back up a number of steps to get back to this point. But going forward, I'm excited about how these pencils are turning out. And getting this kind of results and performance out of the equipment in the shop is to me what makes a project like this fun. Uh, machines are well dialed in, they're true, they're doing their job, blades are sharp, things are clean and waxed, um, things are adjusted for square, so I'm able to make these parts with confidence that they're going to come out the way they need to. It takes time to maintain equipment and get to know the machines and what their quirks are, but when all the necessary little details come together and you can do this kind of work, it's uh, both rewarding and fun. I've given the glue a couple hours to set up on these pencils so I can pop off the clamps, uh, clean up the edges just slightly, and square up one end so that I can lay out the bevels for the corners of the pencil blanks. I've got this awesome clamp rack over there. It actually came with the shop. Uh, it's called the floor. I just pile the clamps on the floor. And it's good to go. Uh, seriously, I'm uh, planning and designing some clamp racking for that wall over there, but that'll be in a future video. I'm squaring up both ends of both blanks, but I'll wait to trim them to final length until after all the bevels are done. I can clean off the slightest bit of glue, squeeze out and smudging on these edges with a sharp putty knife. And there's a little more on one edge than the other because of the clamps being in the way during cleanup. It's important not to have any errant globs of glue on any of these surfaces during the beveling process. All right, for laying out these bevels on the corners of this pencil blank. SketchUp tells me I want 43 64ths for the side facet. If I do my calculations right, I need 13 30 seconds in from each side, and this probably won't even show up in the camera, and that should leave me 43 64ths, which is one less than 11 16ths. So if I come just inside my pencil marks, I'll be in good shape. Sterrett Tools is not a sponsor of this channel, but I really like their tools. That leaves me with the desired 4364th. And again, the precision is a bit uh, semantics. If this is off by a 32nd of an inch, it's not going to be noticeable, but let's aim for perfection and settle for the best we can do, right? I can mark these bevels on the edge as well as on a face to set this up for the table saw where I'll rip the bulk of this off and make the final pass on the joiner. The nice thing about using this process where I'm ripping off the bulk of the material on the table saw with the blade set at 45 degrees and finishing up with the joiner is that the table saw cut doesn't need to be perfect. I just need the same cut on all four corners and it's the depth setting of the joiner that determines the final dimension. With the miter fence set at exactly 45 degrees, I'll take a super light pass with the joiner 
to plane the saw cut marks off and end up at the final pencil mark for the facet on this piece. I'll do a test to make sure I got the depth right and then I can proceed to do each of the four corners with one pass on the joiner. I'll use a slow feed rate for a nice even smooth cut. I'll use a push block to get it started. And then one of my favorite push sticks with the handle forward design to ease the piece through over the cutter head. And that should do it. All four faces are beveled and plain, perfectly smooth. The facets are a nice proportion to the rest of the pencil. So that blank is complete and ready for fitting of the lead in the ends. Getting the lead blank to fit into the pencil is a process of sneaking up on it in the truest sense of the word. I'll start with a cut on the table saw to remove just the slightest amount of material and true up the edge before it goes through the planer. So that's just slightly over width by barely a 32nd of an inch. I'll do the same thing for thickness. And this is the sort of result I'm looking for. Just a 32nd of an inch or so, too big. So I've got two planed index faces and two rough sawn faces that I'll clean up in the thickness planer, starting with the thickness of the piece so it fits in here. You'll notice as I dial in this thickness, I'm not using any measurements anywhere. I'm going just by a test fit. I don't use the veneer on here. I don't use the cut depth. I just lower the planer until it picks up the wood and I can hear it taking the slightest pass. And then I can tell by quarter turns of the crank that I'm lowering a 64th of an inch at a time. And that one pass is about all it takes. It's just a little bit snug, so I'm going to take another 128th of an inch off the back side of this piece, which will be 1 8th of a turn. And you might think I'm kidding, but I'm not. That's the fit that I'm after. And now I'll do the same process to dial in the width. That last 128th of an inch is what it takes to get the fit I'm after for this. I'll flip this end for end, and it's generally pretty close. That is definitely an acceptable fit. If it's too loose, I can put a, a thin piece of clear tape on here to make the lead fit a little more snug and not fall out. If it's just ever so slightly too thick, I can sand it with a hard sanding block to get the lead to fit like it ought to. Well, I kind of got out of the flow a little bit on shooting this uh, Uber Pencil Build video uh, with some other interruptions, but I've got the shop all reconfigured because it's time to sharpen the carpenter's pencil. I've got the blank made with all the facets. The lead blank fits inside snugly. And I have a follower stick uh, for the middle of the pencil. And it's time to put a point on it, uh, similar to this pencil. Um, of all the pencils I've made, uh, this point's a little stubbier than I like to see. And so I did some figuring, and it seems like a good formula for getting a good taper on the point in proportion to the pencil is that the length of the sharpened section to the tip of the lead should be two and a half times the width of the pencil. This one's a little bit stubby, but I'll use those proportions to lay out the tip on this pencil. The overall length from the square end of the pencil to the tip of the lead, if this were a brand new pencil that got sharpened, would be 37 and a quarter inches. So I'll start out with that length, cut it short enough to account for the lead part of it, and then lay out for the tapered wood part, which I'll cut on a bandsaw. I'll leave this pretty piece of the grain in the butt end of the pencil and lay out 37 and 15 64ths, which is what? 37 and a quarter, right? This pencil is, call it three inches wide, so the total length of the sharpened section will be four and a half. And I'm going to go two and three quarters for the shaped wood part and then an inch and three quarters for the exposed lead. That should give a good proportion for a tapered point. It's always scary to just lop it off because there's no redoing that action if it's wrong. I'm actually adding an extra eighth inch or so to the length for the tapered wood part. So in case I need to trim it up during the sharpening process, I'll still have a good length to work with. 
maybe I should just sharpen this. It'd be the world's stubbiest pencil. So now this is cut to the sharpened length. This end will be the part that comes down next to the lead. This line here will be where it transitions from sharpening to full pencil body. So I want to take into account where the lead will be by tracing out the lead on the top of the pencil. And then I'll just trace a shallow curve from this shoulder out to the tip of the pencil. And I want to leave extra thickness where the body of the pencil meets the lead because if I taper this down to a feather, the end of that wood will be so fragile anytime the lead is put in or out, it'll just shear that away. So I leave a little bit of thickness and put a little chamfer on the end to give a visual of the way a real pencil is sharpened without having it be so brittle that it's not practical. I'll duplicate this curve on the other side. It's a lot harder to do with a camera in the way. But basically when I cut this on a bandsaw, I want to make this curve flatter then it'll end up because it's easy to shape it to more of a curve. If I bandsaw it with too much of a curve in there, I risk tapering down the snout of this pencil so that this side is too thin and delicate. But I'll go with those two pencil marks as a rough guide. So I'll make these two cheek cuts on the bandsaw. I'm using a square block just as a guide to keep the pencil face perpendicular to the table so that the cheek cut comes out nice and close to this line that's squared across the side of the pencil. And again, I'll make this cut with just a shallow curve in it to mimic sharpening with a pencil. And I can always add more of a curve to it as I carve it with a chisel, which is the next step. And that ought to do nicely for those two cheek cuts. You can see I've got plenty of thickness left over here where the lead fits in because I don't want that to get fragile. Now that I have these two cheek cuts made, I'll lay out the peering cuts on the two edges of the pencil. And here again, I want to make sure I leave enough uh, thickness between the hole in the pencil and the bandsaw cut so that I've got some latitude in chiseling this down for the final cut. And that's where the hole is for the lead. So I'm leaving almost an eighth of an inch, a good sixteenth. And coming in here with this second curve. And again, I want to make the curve flatter than it'll end up. I can sweep that in with a chisel afterwards. But if I cut too much of a curve in it from the get-go, then the carved point doesn't come out as cool looking. And I like the sweep or taper of those two side cuts. So I'll cut that out on a bandsaw here. Just like that. Well, if there's a secret for sharpening an Uber pencil, it's this right here. I take a piece of the lead core stock that's been fitted to the hole. I put a piece of masking tape on it to snug it up, but I just shove that down in the tip while I'm carving these faces. With that piece inserted, I'm able to shave and carve these four faces down so they taper out nice and thin next to where the lead and the body meet without crumbling it from being thin and brittle. And I've got this pretty sweet record flexible sole plane that I've used on some of the bigger pencils because I can conform the sole of the plane to fit the face of the pencil and then just plane it off. But this pencil is small enough that I'm going to use a chisel instead just because I've got better control than using this big plane. So I've got a very sharp chisel here and I'll just start working this face down from the shoulder here to the point. And I'm opting just to push the chisel for a paring action rather than tapping it with a hammer. I don't really want chop marks in there because this should mimic the way a knife blade would cut this wood, not the way a chisel cuts it. And you can see that I've got much more control at scooping a curve into this face at this point with the chisel. If I've scooped it out already, it's easy to push too hard on the chisel and make the scoop deeper than it should be. But I'm liking this a lot. And I'll take this down till it's about a thin sixteenth of a shoulder right here. And then I'll put just a micro bevel on the edge to take it down to a point.
And I suppose if you're after a different look and you were to glue the lead in and sharpen this all at once, you could get a more realistic point like on a real carpenter's pencil because the two surfaces would blend together. Just like sharpening a real carpenter's pencil, I recommend sharpening the two flat faces first and doing the skinnier edges second. And I suppose if I was making pencils like this on a regular basis, I might get a luthier's plane to plane some of these curved surfaces a little smoother and easier with more control. But for this pencil, a sharp chisel is doing the job nicely. Face is done, it's time to do the edges. Here again, it's a lot easier to set the curve of this sweep at this point if I haven't started out with the sweep too deep from the bandsaw. And after spending a couple hours or so making a pencil like this to this point, I don't want to screw this up now. Walnut's a beautiful wood to carve and work with, even though it's a bit unrealistic for mimicking the look of a real carpenter's pencil. And with the four sides shaved and evened up to my content, I'll take that last final lick off the corners. And here again, it's easy to get carried away and take that bevel all the way down to the corner. So sneak up on it, as I like to say. And some degree of irregularity just gives it an authentic look. As long as it's pleasing to the eye overall. Yeah, I think we'll go with that and call it good. And I've got plenty of length in this scrap of ebony, so I'm just going to cut here and about here and then just snap that end off because there's plenty of lead here without this piece glued to it. So there's the two pieces of lead, and ultimately they need to slip snugly but not too tight in their respective ends of the pencil. And by test fitting this, you can see that this piece is just a little too snug, and it appears to be a little too thick because it wiggles back and forth. So I'll shave the thickness down ever so slightly in the middle by using a sharpened putty knife. This has the same function as a cabinet scraper. But it's a little easier to control on a narrow, thin part like this. It's not going to take much more than those few shavings to get that job done. The humidity where this pencil is going to end up might be such that this wood will swell with the humidity and it might be too snug of a fit, but that remains to be seen. But I'll opt for a nice snug clean fit for here and now and go with that. Well that's the easy end of the pencil. This end is the same fit problem, but then it comes time to carve the lead to a nice attractive point. I got lucky. This is a perfect fit right out of the gate. So I'll mark the pencil length once again, 37 and a quarter, which is right there. And that tells me my, the shoulder of the sharpened lead needs to end up right here. And basically, I want to get a nice point on it. So I'm just going to mark an angled cut on there as a rough guide for the bandsaw. I'll point it out now in case you can't see the pencil marks when the camera zoomed out. I'll get this carving process started on the bandsaw. And then mark a real slight taper for the lead on the two cheeks here. And I'm liking the look of the way the taper of the lead continues from the taper of the wood. So that's acceptable. Now I can slip this out and do a little tune-up on it with a belt sander. Now is the time that anybody has a dedicated belt sander is miles ahead of me. As it is, I've just clamped my 3x21 Porter cable down to the table saw top and just using a scrap of material as a table to raise up the workpiece.
I don't know about you, but I find it pretty difficult to see what's going on sanding that ebony. Black, black, black. Once I've finished working on the piece with the belt sander, I'll just do a final look for the shape and contour and proportion, and I'm liking that a lot. As a final touch, I'll slip the ebony cum graphite into the vise and use a sharpened putty knife to clean up the faces, give it a more realistic hand sharpened look compared to smoothing this off with sandpaper. I can hit the corners with that sharpened knife and get kind of a scraped look to all four faces of the sharpened point. And then just hit these corners slightly with a sanding block just so nobody gets cut. And as I like to say, I'll buy that. I'll put a slight mark here so I know where the lead is going to be set. And then I'll slide the filler stick in until it touches the lead, the mark where I want that lead to be, and then put a mark at this end of the stick. And then I'll take the other end of the lead, line it up on that mark, and cut it here so that when I slide the stick back in and add this end of the lead, I can push the lead out from either end. And that's all there is to it. Well, sharpening the ebony lead is the last woodworking step needed for making these giant pencils. And to finish off these two pencils, I gave them a light sanding to clean them up, and then spray applied a couple of coats of this Verathane Spar Urethane. It's an, a waterborne exterior product that's got great UV protection to preserve the beautiful color of the walnut on these pencils. And I just leave the ebony in its natural state because the dull finish closely resembles that of graphite. And I want to congratulate everyone who's made it through this, the longest video ever here on Next Level Carpentry. I'm not sure how you found this one hour plus video, but as an endurance reward, I can tell you there's still more. But maybe that's more punishment than reward. Anyone with the fortitude to pay attention this long just might be curious enough to see a bit of magic. If that's you, click the link up here. It'll take you to the video I did that shows what I do to make these giant pencils so that they actually write. This solid walnut pencil will get an iconic YouTube channel logo applied to it before I send it off. I made this custom wall mount display rack for the pencil and we'll send both off to the guy who requested it. The fact that he offered to pay me to make him a giant pencil, trusting me to treat him fairly on price, to me is a clear sign of class and of his character. And just so viewers know and hear it straight from me, I have no intention of sending an invoice along with this pencil. It's a gift to express my appreciation for the encouragement, support, and friendship that I've felt through just a few interactions I've had with a man that I've come to respect, admire, and appreciate greatly. The other pencil is going to Daryl for the wall of his shop, although he won't know it until he watches this video. <laughs> Surprise, Daryl. I also made a second custom sized and fit display rack in case Daryl feels like putting this on the wall of his shop. And all I can say is, I hope these guys like their jumbo pencils because I've ruined mine by resharpening it too many times. So all I've got to show for this video is the world's smallest jumbo pencil. Sad face. Well, I've gone on far too long, pushing all reasonable limits of viewer patience. You've been great to bear with me through this whole video. So I'll finish up by asking that you'll consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry. It's free, and you'll be the first to know when new videos are uploaded, so you can avoid them and spend your time playing Angry Birds or sharing with friends on Insta Google Twitface or anything else more worthwhile. So for now, and as always, until next time, thanks for watching and for watching and watching and watching and watching and watching. How much watching would a woodchuck watch if a woodchuck would watch and watch and watch and watch and watch? And watch.